Hi, and welcome to another introductory statistics video. If you are in my class, then this is likely your last introductory statistics video. Congratulations. We're going to talk about regression and correlation in this chapter. Be ready with your formula card, your calculator, and your lecture notes as always. And if you happen to have some handy, don't go out and buy it special, but if you happen to have graph paper handy, then that would be a cool tool to use in this chapter as well because, as you'll notice, we're going to do a bit of graphing. Uh, so we'll start with the scatter plot, and uh, the scatter plot allows us to graph two variables at a time. Everything that we've done before this chapter is just one variable at a time, so all of the, the previous stuff we've just focused on one single variable at a time. We may have collected multiple variables, but we've only analyzed one variable at a time. In this chapter, though, we're going to start analyzing two variables at a time, and we're going to look at the relationship that's happening between those two variables. And that's what a scatter plot will show us. So here uh, we have two different variables, internet usage for a country and gross domestic product. The gross domestic product is how much a country sells to other countries, and it's a measurement of how wealthy a nation is. Uh, so here they have put gross domestic product as our x variable. Um, our x variable should always explain, it says it right here, explanatory. Uh, so our x variable explains, and I kind of associate it, use that as a mnemonic device to remember that x goes with explain, and y is the other one, so y goes with response. Um, so usually we list x first, um, but here they've listed x second, and the way that we know that it really should be GDP, that's our x, is we, we think about it. We, we say, would internet usage explain how much a country sells, or would how much a country sells, and therefore how rich the country is, uh, explain how much it can afford internet usage? And it's the latter. So how wealthy a country is means um, that its citizens would be wealthier and would be better able to afford unlimited data plans or uh, devices that had 3G or 5G or, you know, whatever, um, and that Wi-Fi everywhere, cell, to cell towers everywhere. Um, so that kind of ubiquitousness of Internet um, would come with countries that have high gross domestic products. And it's the GDP that does the work for us that explains why we have a good internet usage. So that's why this is the x-axis. By the way, this bottom axis that goes from left to right is always the x-axis, and this um, axis here along the left side that always goes from top to bottom is always the y-axis. So y is always here, and x is always here. Uh, we will look at graphing one of the 39 countries that we're given. Uh, I like to start with GDP, or I like to start with the X variable, which is GDP. And so 32.41 is going to be almost exactly halfway between 30 and 35. So we'll go along that line. And then 23.31 is going to be almost a third of the way between 20 and 30, so we'll go along that line, and where those meet, we find our dot for Ireland. And so that's how the dot for Ireland was determined. You can do all 38 of them that way. We won't go into that much detail since you've seen one. Uh, and then we look at the dots and we say, is there some sort of trend? And I believe there's a linear trend, a nice um, well, actually, I believe there's more of a curve trend, but I think that you could put a straight line. If you could draw a straight line, you could put a straight line, um, and then it would fit pretty well. Um, now, neither one of these is going to be a perfect fit. Um, I think the curve, I could have done a better job with the curve, but I think it's slightly more curved, so a curve would fit the data better than a line, but the line doesn't do a bad job either. We see that it increases from left to right, so that's part of the trend. The increasing from left to right is positive, um, greater than zero, positive. So whenever it's going uphill from left to right, it's positive. Whenever it's going downhill from left to right, it is said to be negative. Um, and then whenever it is flat, it is said to be no slope or zero slope, uh, if it's just flat. And 
here is the linear regression equation. We should really have little hats. And on some of the slides, I will have little hats on top of Y. Um, that's the caret symbol. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, the caret symbol, a little um, caret there on top of the Y. And what that means is that the Y for the regression equation is only a prediction. It's not going to be the exact value. It's going to be the value that we expect to happen on average. As we saw in the previous slide, um, we have a lot of variability. So if this is our line, um, then the value we would expect to have happen at 10 would be this, but we might have something like this instead. So um, there might be a lot of difference between uh, what we expect to happen with the regression line and what actually happens. Um, and so that's why we put the little hat on top of these. Uh, and then for the line itself, we have um, AX plus B. And now you might see the X part last instead of first. Here the uh, term with the x happens first, and the term with the x is always the slope. The term without the x is always the y-intercept. Let's talk about the y-intercept first because we would graph it first. Um, so the, the term that does not have x attached to it um, here doesn't have x attached to it, so that's going to be 1. And that tells us that when our x is 0. When we plug in 0 here, we get 2 times 0 plus 1. 1 is what we would get. So this is always when we plug in 0, it knocks this term out, and we're left with just the y-intercept. So the y-intercept is always where we cross the y-axis. So here at the point 1 is where we can put our first dot. Um, if you are trying to graph a line, all you need is two points, two distinct points, um, and you can graph the line. So I'll put my first point there at 1. And then what the slope tells us, what A tells us, which always is attached to the x, and attached to the x here, that is 2, and so our slope is 2. Um, 2 is the same thing as 2 divided by 1, right? So 2 divided by 1 is equal to 2. Um, if I had a fraction as my slope, like 3 fourths, I would just go ahead and leave it as 3 over 4. I wouldn't do 3 fourths divided by 1. But if I have an integer or a decimal, I can just divide it by 1 if I want to. Um, and then we are going to go up 2 units. That's what the slope tells us. Go up 2 units for every 1 unit that we're going over. Um, so I'm going to go up 2 units from where I am. I start here at this point on my line. So I'm going to go up two units from where I am to three and over one unit and put another dot here. And if I were to write this point, um, I always write x comma y. So I would write the point as one comma three. Um, and this point right here um, would also be x comma y. So it would be zero for my x and 1. So um, that's how I would write those two points. And then I would, um, if I had graph paper, I would take a ruler and uh, connect the dots so that it would be a straighter line than the line I have. Let me do a straight line for you. Uh, if you haven't finished copying all this down on top of your lecture notes, you may want to pause here because I'm going to erase all this when I minimize um, discard. And I am going to Let's see, can we make this a little bit bigger? Yeah, and whoa. Um, that's not what I meant to do. Ah, let's do new. Don't save. Um, and I want to make it bigger and then I want to move. Yeah, there we go. And I want to do a line. Uh, this is, you won't have to do very as much as I just did, um, but this is a little bit like what Newton's going to be like when you go to graph your lines in Newton. This is a GeoGebra application that was free for me um, in the App Store on my Mac. I'm not sure on a PC uh, how that would work, if, it's, if there's a free option for PC or not. But probably there is, if you're interested. You don't need this tool, though. Um, it's embedded into Newton. 
And so I want to graph the 1 first. Um, so put it exactly at 0, 1. And then two dots make a line, so I want to go up 2 and over 1 exactly. And there's my second dot. And then it gives me my equation. So um, it's not in the perfect form that I'm looking for um, because really I want the 2x to be over here. Uh, so I would add 2x to both sides and I would get y equals 2x plus 1. But uh, it, is, it is the same equation. It's just in a different format. So that's how we would go about graphing the lines, the regression lines. And then uh, when we look at the graph of the regression line and we look at the scatter plot data as well, there are three things that we can say about it. We've already talked a bit about direction. Direction can be positive, negative, or zero. Um, we have talked a little bit about strength, but I don't know if I've said it quite that way. Uh, so this one would be perfectly strong because it's perfectly in a line. This one is actually pretty strong. Um, most students at the beginning might not think it looks very strong, but this is pretty strong. This one is not very strong. Um, it, it would be considered weak. And this one would be considered no association at all. Um, and then in addition to the direction and the strength, we have is it linear, is it curved, is it a cluster, um, different clusters, or is there no pattern at all? And then of course we should also look for outliers. Uh, the R value it tells us both strength and direction. So the absolute value of R and how close it is to 1 or negative 1, um, that tells us the strength and then the sign, whether it's negative or positive, tells us the direction. Uh, so here, this is an R value of positive 1, so we know it increases from left to right. This is an R value of negative 1, so it decreases from left to right. Um, and so that tells us if it's a positive association or negative association. Uh, this is positive 8, so it increases from left to right. Um, and it's pretty strong. So uh, this chart is a chart that I made to try to help guide students. Uh, and I made it based on answers that I saw because I didn't get any real definitive guidance from the text. So I wanted to give students more definitive guidance on what is weak and what is strong and what's kind of in between. So anything I found, um, the text saying, anything that's between half and negative half is considered pretty weak. Um, especially the closer it gets to zero, the weaker it is. Um, but negative a half or positive a half, that's still pretty weak. Anything that's between half and 0.7 or on the negative end too, that would be considered sort of in between, not weak, not strong. We'll call that moderate. And then if it's more than 0.7, it's considered strong. Um, it may not look very strong. I mean, this may not look that strong to you, but it is actually considered a strong association. Um, 0.7 was probably about where that GDP and internet usage was. Uh, and so it's just on the verge of being strong, I think is what that would have been. And then if it's 0.9, then it's considered very strong. So uh, that's kind of how the linear correlation coefficient r will go. And that's on your formula card. Well, how to find r is on your formula card. Uh, and then used car dealerships. So if we want to talk about positive, negative, or no association, uh, what association would you expect between the age of the car and the gas mileage? Um, my youngest just turned 16, and we've been looking at cars. We haven't gotten one yet because my eldest is about to go away to college, and our driveway is crowded, so we are going to wait until August to purchase a car, but I've definitely been looking at odometer um, readings. But but here we actually mean how many miles per gallon uh, does the car get. And I've been looking at that too, the reported miles per gallon for the car and of course the age of the car. So the age of the car and gas mileage, which you expect to there to be a positive relationship or a negative relationship or no association. Well, as the car ages, 
um, that would be along the x-axis and the miles per gallon that you would get you would expect that to decrease uh, so the engine it probably wouldn't be nearly as dramatic as this decrease um, and it may not be linear but you would expect for as the car gets older and older it's going to be less and less efficient uh, gunk is going to build up I mean even if you do maintenance and hopefully you do maintenance um, you're going to have some build up that's going to happen and it's going to operate less and less efficiency so efficiently so we would expect a negative association here and then regression so this chapter is on regression what do we mean by regression I thought I would use because this this term is used in military situations too so if you regress in a military movement that's going to be pulling back or withdrawing your troops. Uh, it's also the act of reasoning backward or if you were doing physical therapy or something like that and you regress that's the opposite of progress so you're actually moving backward in terms of how well you're doing. Uh, so but the act of reasoning backward is very closely related to what we will do. We will look at the data that we have and we will say what could explain this data, what line or what curve could explain this data, and so that's what we do when we do regression. Here we have a scatter plot with four data values, and we are going to expect that this regression equation explains these four data values. Uh, the residual is going to be the difference, and you can see the little lines here. The difference between the actual data value and the line, we call that residual or residual error, um, sometimes also just called error. So these little errors, the residuals, um, are going to be, if you add them all up together, it's going to turn out to be zero. Uh, and so we want to minimize the errors, but we could draw a line like this. And if that were the case, um, let me do a different color here. Um, if that were the case, then my sum might also be zero if I drew it well enough. My sum of the, the different lines, because some of them are going to be negative, the ones below the line, these two are going to be negative in this case, and these two would be positive, and so they may still sum to be zero. Um, here, these on the pink, um, or magenta, um, these three would be negative, and this one would be positive, and they actually, I know, do some to be zero. Uh, and so, but the, the cyan do too. Um, so, you know, the question is, what, what's the best line? Um, the best line is not the one that sums to be zero. Um, our goal is to minimize all of these lines, um, and certainly there's more cyan than there is magenta, um, because even this one um, has more cyan than magenta. Every single one of them actually has more cyan than they do magenta. So uh, there is a way to determine uh, the line that best fits, and part of that determination first involves computing the R value if you're doing it by hand, uh, and we will look at the R value in a second, but essentially what the R value does is it tries to minimize the squared residuals. Uh, so that's our, our goal. Remember before on this, um, the, the negatives canceled out with the positives, and so that's why we were able to have, even though these are bigger, they cancel each other out. Um, to keep them from canceling each other out, we square the residual, so uh, that's what we do. And this, the best regression equation is considered to be the equation with the least squared residuals and so it's called the least squared method and you might see the regression equation called the least squared regression equation or something along those lines least squares regression equation uh, what that means is essentially that you are uh, using this method that we're going to use to let our calculator do it for us uh, let me show you the regression value, the R value. Uh, we've already talked about what the R value means. This is the R value equation 
for finding it by hand according to our textbook. So what this is saying is that you would have a column for your x coordinates and a column for your y coordinates. Those would be given to you. And then you would need to make a column for xy to, to find this one. So you would have x times y. Um, and then you would also need a column for x squared um, uh, to find this one. And you would need a column for y squared um, to find this one. Uh, and then you would need to sum all of those because you have uh, the sum of xy is right here. And you have the sum of x right there. And you have the sum of y right there. Oh, and we also have the sum of y here, and we square it, and the sum of x here, and then we square it. Um, and then we have the sum of x squared, the sum of x squared uh, here, and then we have the sum of y squared here. Uh, and then we would need to multiply by the number of data values that we have, uh, and add and subtract and square and multiply and square root and divide all kinds of stuff, and eventually we would get our R value if we did all that work. And imagine if you had 100 different pairs of data values that you had to go through and do all of this for. Um, or, <laughs> or, 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 you could use your calculator to do all that work for you, which is definitely what we're going to do. Um, we'll do an example here in a minute. And uh, the, we've already talked a little bit about explanatory and response when we talked about our very first GDP versus versus internet uses example. I should also say that the explanatory variable is considered the independent variable. It stands by itself. Um, you determine it without consulting anything else. So you just decide what you want x to be and plug it in. Um, but then it spits out what y is, and so in that way, y is the dependent variable. So the explanatory variable is always independent, and the response variable is always dependent. And here is our example that we're going to use to find the regression equation. And then to answer number two, we're going to use the R value to answer number two. So I mentioned that we were going to compute the R value. That's where we're going to, here's where we're going to do that. Um, and then we're actually going to use the regression equation to predict. That's really the point of doing the regression equation is so that we can predict. So we're going to predict for eight hours. Uh, so find the regression equation, y hat equals, uh, what did we say, ax plus b, and then is the regression equation reliable for predicting? We're going to do the r value for that one to see if it's strong or not, and if it is strong, it's reliable, and if it's not strong, it's not reliable, uh, and then we'll plug in to our regression equation to find this answer. And we're going to use this data for all of our stuff, and so let's do that. Um, here is my calculator. I already have the data in there and you can check 5, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 15, 22, 28, 31, 33, 36. Um, by the way, if I would pause the video and do this along with me if you can. And then our formula card tells us for this, and hopefully you have your formula card handy to look at it under chapter 12. Uh, under linear regression for both the regression equation and the r-value. We want to do stat um, and then calc and then option 4 for linreg. There's actually one thing that we want to do before that. Um, and let me, let me do that now. Uh, so you don't have to do this every time. You only ever have to do it once. And if you have a calculator that somebody else has used for the course, you probably don't even have to do it now. But let's go ahead and do it now. Um, second zero, which is the catalog. And we want to turn our diagnostic on. And I don't know why it doesn't come on um, prepackaged with the diagnostic on, because I can't imagine doing the regression equation and not wanting to see the R value, but this will tell us the R value as well. So what we want is the function that says diagnostic on. So we will jump down to the D's and my alpha is already on. I can tell because it says A there. So I will just press the, the key that has D and then keep scrolling. You could just scroll forever and not do the D if you didn't want to do that step. 
Um, and then I'm just going to hit enter twice now that I've selected diagnostic on and it says done and that is what will display the R and the R squared for us. If your R and your R squared aren't displaying then you need to do the step. Uh, so the formula card tells us stat and then calc and then option four. There's actually two different options. We want the AX plus B option instead of the A plus BX and the Really, you could do either, but the option four better matches Newton. And so uh, that's, that's the one that I'll go with here because it better matches the homework system. So the homework system may say blank X plus blank. And if you did this option, you would have to put B first because your blank X, your B has to go with X plus blank, and your A would be in the second blank. So um, here your A is in the first blank and your B is in the second blank like you would expect it to be. So option four is the one I selected, L1 and L2. Let's make sure that we want L1 to be our explanatory variable. Um, hours of doing jump shots in practice and the points scored in the game. Yeah, yeah, that hours should explain how many points she's scoring. And uh, store regression equation. F4 on most calculators, not all. Um, will let us store the regression equation into y1 and that'll be nice when we graph it. Um, so I'm going to do f4 which is the alpha key and right here on trace so alpha trace and I'm going to put it in y1 so I could hit enter one either one and then I'll scroll down to calculate and hit enter um, and now I have the regression equation uh, and I would write it out full of y with a hat on top um, and then equals and instead of a I would put 2.971 I would use four significant digits because in number three we're going to use number one to predict four eight um, so I'm going to do 2.971 and then b uh, or x plus b of 0. 0.7647 so again, four significant digits for B because we're using this regression equation to predict. Uh, and then my R value is 0.99. I could just do three significant digits here, 0.998. Um, before, we, before we move on to the answers to these, I want to take a peek at the graph. Um, and I want to look at it with, I already put my Y equals when I, I did that store regression, store reg EQ, it, that stands for store regression equation. So I already have my regression equation stored in here. Um, but I want to do the scatter plot too, so that's second and stat plot. And all of mine are off right now, so I can go into, if, if there were two or three on, I would turn all but the first one off. We want to turn the first one on though, so I highlight the on key and I press enter, um, and that turns it on. And then I select scatter plot. It was actually already selected, so I didn't have to do anything there. L1 and L2 is what I want. And you can use any of these, but myself being old, I definitely don't want to use this one because I couldn't see those. Um, I like this one because I think it's the easiest to see. But with you young whippersnappers, um, you might want to use uh, one of the smaller ones or a different one. And then zoom nine for our statistical zoom. And you can see this is a really nice fit. Actually, it's a little bit too nice. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, so we will look at the answers to these, the regression equation. Is it reliable? And if Amelia practices for eight hours, what would she expect her score to be? Um, so first off, the regression equation, and I got this from our output when we did stat calc 4, um, plugging in A and plugging in B and using four significant digits for each. So that's my answer to that one. And then uh, is this a good regression equation? Yes. Our R value was 0.998, and even 0.9 is considered very strong. So 0.998 is like super strong. Um, so it's actually a little bit too strong, and that's what I meant before about how perfect the data seemed to be. Um, basically, the uh, percentage of variation, well, we'll talk about that actually. A little bit later, um, but keep that 0.998 in mind. So we're about to talk 
about that in a slide or two. Um, and then using the regression equation to predict for what if she practiced eight hours, we plug in eight and we multiply um, just like this says that we do. And then we add just like this says that we do. So we would just do this in our calculator and we would get, um, when we give three significant digits for our final answer, we would get 24.5. So obviously she's not gonna score exactly 24.5 points in a single game, but this is the value that we would expect to see on average. Now, if you just eyeballed this and tried to predict, you would get pretty close. Um, you would get 25, but of course I require three significant digits, so that wouldn't be a correct answer for 25. It would be 24.5. Um, so, but even, even here, um, this one is only close because this is such a a perfect association. If it were a less perfect association, um, this might be quite far off from what you would guess by just looking at these two values. Because um, the regression equation doesn't consider just these two values, it considers all of these values when it went to make the regression equation. And uh, so we talk about slope and we talk about R, remember that the sign for slope, whether it's negative or positive, should always match the sign for the correlation, whether the R value is negative or positive, because both of them tell the direction. Um, but there are a lot of differences too, because R tells the strength of the association, but the slope does not tell the strength. So you could have a really steep slope, but have the data values all scattered about. Or you could have a really shallow scope slope and have all of the data values right on top of the line. Um, so the the slope, how it tells how steep or shallow the rise over run will be, but it doesn't tell the strength of the association. Also, uh, the slope has units. It will be whatever the units for the y variable are divided by whatever units the x variable. Um, is, uh, but the R value has no units. And then if you swap X and Y around, if you say, oh, no, nope, I want um, the other variable should be my explanatory variable, and you flip-flop them, then actually um, if your slope was four-thirds, then your slope becomes three-fourths and um, vice versa. But your R value stays exactly the same whether you flip-flop them because the relationship between X and Y doesn't change whether whatever you call X and whatever you call Y. And then, this is what I was talking about before. Remember, our R value before was 0.998. Uh, what that would tell us, um, actually, we want the R squared instead of the R value on this one. Uh, so let me go back to Stack Health 4, and I won't do this door reg EQ this time. Um, so 0.995 is our R squared value. Um, 0.998, if we square 0.998, um, or especially 0 0.99758, 0 0.99758. If we square it, we should get the 0.995 that we saw, and we do. Um, we don't get it to, to very accurate past that, but we do get at least that. Yeah, that's what we want. Um, so you see that my R squared value is 0 0.995. What that means is that for the Amelia example, 99.5% could be explained, 99.5% um, of Amelia's points scored could be explained only from the hours that she spent practicing. And that seems fishy to me because what if she were sick? Or what if the other team she was playing was amazing? Or what if the other team sucked? Or uh, what if her boyfriend just broke up with her? Or what if uh, she had an amazing day and her parents gave her, you know, all kinds of awesome attention? Um, and, you know, so there are other factors um, besides how much you practice that in can influence your performance in a game. Uh, I would say the hours practice is the strongest influence for sure, and maybe even accounting for more than 50% of the points scored, um, maybe even as much as 75 or 80% of the points scored, but to account for 99.5% 
of the points scored seems unrealistic to me. So I think they made these numbers up. That was my point. Um, and my point was to explore um, this idea of the coefficient of determination, r squared. We always use it to take r squared to multiply it by 100% and to say the percentage of variation in whatever the y variable is, is explained by whatever the x variable is. So in other words, here, um, the variation in the points scored is explained by the hours spent practicing. So 99% of the, 99.5% according to our data of the points scored would be explained by the practice. Um, so that's the coefficient of determination and uh, extrapolation. So when I first started teaching out at Fort Campbell, the um, I drove a car that was 13 years old when I very first started. And I kept teaching out there with that car for at least five years. And so that would have been um, starting at 13, but then going to 18. So that would have been like way down here, right? Um, so my car would have been worth like, um, um, let's see, that's negative. Even here is like negative $6,000. Is that right? Yeah, negative $6,000. So that would have been like negative twelve or 15000 And, you know... I love that car. It it was not worth a whole lot of money. Um, it may have just been worth a thousand dollars. I ended up giving it to a dear friend of mine because she really needed a car, uh, and maybe it was only worth five hundred dollars. But um, it was it was worth something. It was not worth negative value. Um, certainly not negative twelve thousand uh, dollars. So obviously this trend does something like this because even scrap metal is I believe $500 so uh, if you had to pay to have it towed then it might not you might almost break even um, but certainly it's always going to to be um, above zero or about zero and uh, the the thing about extrapolation is that it's predicting for data that we don't have uh, and that was so true of coronavirus uh, when they were trying to predict how it would spread, um, when it would stop, how many people would be infected. They were extrapolating severely because this virus had never happened before. Um, it had never spread like this before. And, and all of their stuff was, was guesswork. Uh, and so, of course, they got a lot wrong. But I knew, as, as a mathematician, I knew they were going to get a lot wrong. And they emphasized that they were going to get a lot wrong, but the public really gets upset um, when, when people get a lot wrong and they aren't precise in their predictions. But sometimes that's just the best that you can do is extrapolate. And there's nothing else that you can do, but just be aware that when you extrapolate, is very risky because you're not going to be right. <laughs> um, you're going to have a wide, wide, wide margin of error. Uh, and then we want to talk about, briefly, the regression outlier. Basically, both the orange and the red are considered regression outliers because they are way far away from the rest of the data. So here is the rest of the data, um, and these are way far away from them. Now, the red one is a special type of regression outlier because it is influential when it is way above or way below the line, um, or basically just far away from the line, see the orange is close to the line, then it's going to influence the line if you add it in. Um, so for instance, right here with the red dot, the line would be a lot steeper. Um, and that would mean that the y-intercept would change too because it would go down a good deal. And if it changes the regression equation significantly, then it's said to be an influential observation. Um, oops, let's go that way. Oh, and one of the most important topics, most important points in all of statistics is that correlation does not imply causation. So here we have uh, Nicholas Cage going along through here, um, and he seems to mirror swimming pool drownings. Uh, the number of films that he makes each year um, seems to pretty well mirror swimming pool drownings, but that is just 
um, just a coincidence. It is definitely not uh, one causing the other to happen. So correlation does not imply causation. Here's another great example of how correlation does not imply causation. Let's say that you have a fire. Um, and you look at the, well, you look at all of the fires maybe for an entire state. And you look at how many firefighters reported to that fire. And you look at the cost of damages. Well, if you assume that correlation implies causation, then you would expect to see that the correlation here, the number of firefighters, um, surely would cause less damages. And so that's going to be a negative association. But you'd be wrong. Um, so it turns out that when you look at the data, the, there's a positive association between these two. Um, so do more firefighters cause more damages because there is a positive association? Uh, no, certainly not. That, that's because correlation does not imply causation. So more firefighters are there and there is more damage, but more firefighters are not causing there to be more damage. What else might be occurring? There are three different things that are all working together, actually. Um, so how far you are from the station when you call it in, they look at that and they say, oh, by the time we get there, um, the fire might have exploded, you know, and, and grown exponentially. So we need to send more firefighters out. Um, the intensity of the fire, so uh, especially if it's like a chemical fire, um, they're going to send more people out uh, than they would otherwise. And the existing size of the fire, so let's say a couple lived out in the country and they came home uh, from eating out and their house um, was uh, completely inflamed. Uh, so it wasn't just a little fire um, that was, you know, a cubic foot or something like that. It was it was the whole house <laughs> inflamed. Uh, so all of that is going to factor into how many firefighters they're going to send out. And of course, all of those will mean more costs and damages instead of less. And so that is chapter 12, the last chapter. Uh, we are almost done. Yay! This is such a hard course and you have worked so hard, I'm sure. Um, I'm so excited that, that you have given so much to the course and so excited that we're about to to end and uh, I wish you well. Um, as always, as you go through the discussions, the homework, the projects, and the quizzes, use your formula card, uh, especially those calculator shortcuts and the calculator. It will save you an enormous amount of time in the linear regression equations and in computing the R value and the R squared value. Uh, use your lecture notes and your textbook and Newton instructions and if all of these fail you, please, please, please message me. Thank you and good luck.